All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Bob Planquet. I will be sharing today's uh, uh, Origin Center webinar. And uh, we are joined today by scientists uh, through Zoom and by the general public through a live stream on YouTube. Uh, so it's great to have you all here. Um, for those of you that haven't been here before or haven't heard about the Origin Center and its activities, it's a Dutch in initiative which tries to bring together uh, scientists from many different disciplines working on some of the most fundamental questions, the origin and evolution of life uh, on Earth and in the universe. And in this webinar series, we invite leading researchers from around the world, um, physicists, astronomers, chemists, biologists, and scientists from all disciplines. Um, today, we're very happy to have uh, Dieter Braun as our speaker. Um, and I'll introduce to you to, uh, to him in a minute. Uh, but before I do that, let me just remind you of the, the program of today. Uh, after my introduction, Dieter will give a talk for about half an hour, maybe a little bit more. And then there will be time to ask questions. Uh, please post those in the chat. And that is both for uh, uh, those on Zoom and for those on YouTube. And um, we will try to discuss and clear up these questions uh, after Dieter's talk. And at around five o'clock, we will uh, uh, close the session and the live stream on YouTube uh, will be stopped. Uh, but a few of you will have, uh, have registered to continue discussions with, uh, with Dieter. And so for those of you, uh, stick around after five. I will make Dieter a co-host co and uh, uh, you can keep on discussing science uh, for as long as you all like. All right, so with that brief introduction, uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, uh, Dieter Braun from the University of Munich who's with us today. Uh, Dieter has a great group in Munich uh, working on the origin of replication in environments that are out of thermodynamic equilibrium, such as a heat or pH gradient. And he is particularly interested in how natural selection can arise spontaneously in such environments. And uh, I have his talk here. It's called Emergence of Life in the Lab, Microscale Non-Equilibria for the Emergence of Life. Please, Dieter. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks for bringing all these things together and uh, publishing in YouTube will open everything to uh, more public. Yes, so I think it's the most fundamental question, I think most exciting one, and actually also one where uh, quite some progress has been done in the last 10 years and more to come in the next 10 years. Um, basically, we try to think and uh, by experimental mimics how life could emerge and you know this would be a kind of a hot spring poodle you could think of that's a, a video from Iceland where you know boiling water comes out it's surrounded by porous rocks and you just start thinking about what could happen in there and um, the basic idea in trying to get things together is put some that molecule by itself into some non-equilibrium and add all the boundary conditions you know or you think about to think about how this can evolve to living system, which basically means that can you get towards a cycle of Darwinian evolution? You know, things that recycling, you get more and more complex sequences and get things to a point that you can start to think that this could be living and getting more complex. So in the past, we, we did experiments like these where we have a closed system where we have a warm and a cold side. And that was quite funny because you can see here by this beads movement that molecules are cycled between warm and cold side. And you could actually use an effect that molecules go from the cold to the warm side, that from the warm to the cold side, sorry, that they actually cycle here and go down, which is here seen in the experiment called an effect of thermophoresis. And that was actually quite interesting because as you try to feed the system continuously by bringing in new molecules, they are accumulated down here. And that feeding flow here essentially also gives you a selection for longer, in this case, DNA molecules. So that was a setting where we thought this, a lot of things come together for this, um, but, and that's a big but, uh, is 
we used a protein here to do it. And as you might know that if you have a protein needs about, in this case, 3000 bases, and it moreover needs the machinery of a ribosome to make out of the sequences, the protein, that's something, you know, you could not start life with. So, but it, it means to show, we, we just try to get close to, to the system and eventually, you know, of course, we'll try to hop on for something that really only a few molecules come together to do things. But I think with these experiments, we can already learn a lot about these systems. In this case, you know, the fluid flow is, goes between the warm side and the strands are separating, the cold sides we are replicating. And with this flow and the accumulation, actually the shorter strands get pushed out and the long strands stay inside. So they are quite some aspects of that Darwinian evolution happening in it. And uh, beside the chemistry, which is driven here by phosphates, triphosphates on the nucleotides, which come in here, things are driven by non-equilibrium physics. And that's a bit this balance of chemistry and physics, which I find very fascinating in, in this setting. And that's just a, a gel uh, showing that as you tune in this inside flow, um, the molecules get more and more chance to be flushed out. And while at slow flow, the molecules up to say 40 bases stay inside, you can actually nicely tune this for longer lengths if you increase the flow velocity. So there's some tunability in the system. And if you, the one pore you would be interested in had that flow velocity, you could get such and such a cutoff of the length. So that's what we try to aim try to make machineries which are keeping itself into evolution evolving state but for what i'll try to talk today is is a little bit more also motivated to come around that protein here sometimes we manage sometimes we don't and to let you learn a bit where the problems are if we go forward for more simple systems so the one question is how can we do that without proteins and and one of the ideas and prospects of the field is an RNA world that you hope for a setting where actually as short as possible RNA strands can do the replication where I just showed uh, a tag pro uh, polymerase, a protein doing the replication. Now, can you do that with RNA? And initially it was not clear whether we can also find a, a chamber solution for that. Uh, because these molecules are very sensitive to temperature under the operational conditions, which for all these RNA ribosomes and need a lot of magnesium. And because the high magnesium content at higher temperatures, they really degrade very fast. But then we, we just thought, let's give it a try. And um, we teamed up with Jerry Joyce, which is one of the experts of, of, of those ribozymes and figured out actually a geometry, it's just round, which we heat in the center, which we did already in the past for these polymerases. Initially, we thought that shouldn't work because the convection is much too fast. If you, you, know, you put it on a computer, you calculate what the flow speed, you get things that they're cycling about once per 30 seconds. And these ribozymes need a little bit more time, you know, half an hour or so. So we thought, oh, this is getting tricky, but it turned out that the buffer solutions Jerry Joyce was using are very viscous. And then even, you know, just using his best recipe, we immediately got a success in here, which was actually quite uh, promising because the viscosity slows things down to the point that we actually cycle uh, comparably in temperature space than his experiments. So what he does uh, run in a thermal cycler uh, are these spikes in white. So you do very, very short spikes to 70 degrees, where you actually have a short piece of 35 mer as enough time to separate without being destroyed by hydrolysis. RNA is very picky, and if it's high temperature, high magnesium here, it starts to be chewed up just by the heat. So it turns out that the, you can optimize this, and uh, these are the spikes a convection simulation of one of the flow lines on the outer side. And they actually make a similar temperature cycle. And that looks actually quite interesting. And we figured out that what J. 
Okay, Joyce was doing in the thermal cycler, we just got the ribozyme from him, and we do it in a convection cycler, is actually very much comparable, which is nice to see. So you get the same amplification from these two primers. So these primers are attaching here, and then the blue thing is elongated. Then you separate it, and then you get a second primer from the other side that you get an exponential uh, replication going. So that was nice, and we thought uh, um, uh, that's good and interesting. We looked at it by attaching fluorescent probes in here, and then we actually saw some things which we didn't fully understand, and it took us uh, quite a while to understand everything uh, fully. So uh, number one, we saw actually that in this stripe pattern, we got an accumulation of these ribozymes. And uh, if we put that in a computer, it was not understandable, even with all those thermophoresis of going from warm to cold. Since there were PEG molecules inside, you can invert the thermophoresis. It that just didn't match. And then we actually looked at the molecules and figured out that under these conditions, they are making small aggregates, which of course diffuse much slower. And with these parameters, we could actually determine why it's accumulating here. And uh, we could, you know, test it out for just a longer piece of DNA that would not, it would accumulate here as a point-like function, but only if we take the sequence of that polymerized ribozyme, either we encode it as DNA or RNA, actually doesn't matter, it makes these blobs, and these blobs then actually make this accumulation to a ring. And that's actually funny for that geometry because then the molecules are a bit outside and are in the colder area. So they accumulate in an area where they can survive longer. And this is a prediction of the degradation time. And you can see these over many orders of magnitude, how this high temperature up here is actually very dangerous for the RNA. And the RNA mostly sticks around here. And over the short guys, of cycling. So that's a nice habitat where you can accumulate things in the more cold area. So this accumulation is not as strong as we saw in the other system. So it's still an open question how much we can do that and understand that. But you know, that point like accumulation and that ring like accumulation, we could figure out in a computational model, uh, which we always like a lot to be able to predict how things work out, because then we can estimate how things could go on in the future. That's still this ribozyme here, which looks very small, but in reality, it's a huge molecule, which has this binding pattern, which is a primer to attach to that small part here. And it's still the open question out there, how could you get this sequence? This is a sequence of that ribozyme actually doing the job here, and it's uh, I think 180 uh, bases around here, all have to be precise. So it's a big, big challenge to figure out how these exact sequences could come about. And one of the ideas um, how you could get there rather realistically or not, we'll have to see, is that you have smaller chunks of that and ligate those smaller chunks together. Um, and that that's one of the things we'd like to see. And of course, you know, a usual way to, to look into that ligation reaction, which means that you have here in white, hope you can see it here. Ah, okay, here's my pen also. Ah, oh, it's a bit overly sensitive. Sorry, I'm scribbling it. Uh, so that can be replicated under, again, warm, cold, warm, cold conditions that these gray ones come here together and ligate. And this is now a ligation which you could run purely chemical, and uh, in this case, we did it a little bit of the harsh experimental chemical agent of EDC. And we just wanted to see, is it possible to you know, have these conditions that in the heat you're separating? Again, you have the problem that the EDC is then attacking uh, all the parts of here, we use DNA molecules. And after a lot of optimization, we could get things uh, being able to exponentially replicate. You know, this is, you have the template, you have thermal cycling every hour and uh, no, every half hour, sorry, it's this point here. That's the theory curve. That's the experiment you get from, <coughs> from gels. And you actually can feed the reaction by serial dilution. So after one hour, you remove some of the molecules 
and you add new feeding molecules to it, and let's you know that simulates the flow of things which flow by, and you can think about those traps that they keep it there. Still, we have to do a very fast temperature cycling here. All needs to be optimized because again, the high temperature is dangerous to the reaction. The EDC chews up the molecule, make linkages, modifications to the bases which is detrimental and it's again difficult to find a compromise and and that's what we found it, it it seems to be a difficult system so this is the performance we could get and this is actually the expectation we would have expected from you know just a simple model of replication if this ligation would be as perfect as actually we are expecting edc to do so um small step forwards the small step backwards still doesn't look like so realistic here and um, but it's worth trying and it's you know you learn a lot if you try it and a lot more details in this reaction uh, what are the ways you should run it um being a bit frustrated with that uh, chemical ligation we thought about could we run the reaction completely without uh ligating ligation in terms of chemical linkage and that's a project we we were working quite a bit on it just came out where we thought about can we go a little bit like a laser system to activate the molecules just by temperature and then cycle and replicate the reaction by two lower temperatures and we could reset the molecules but higher temperatures and we try to learn the lessons from from uh, what the um, uh, DNA machine guys are doing. So the idea is here actually to start with molecules which on the blue sequence can stick to each other and they have hairpins at the outside. They can actually bind to each other these hairpins but if we just cool it down to 45 degrees they're actually not doing it because those hairpins are still closed so you by heating to 95 to 90 degrees uh, you can open it up, cool it, and then they're actually in a metastable state. So that's our activated molecules. They would like to react, but they kinetically don't have the time to do so. So in that sense, this is not yet replicating uh, because it's missing a template. And the idea is now that a template, for example, here is sequence 001, could add to it, and you can have here blue, dark blue, binding here to the bright blue, if they attach here, they're close enough, the local concentration is high enough that those from time to time open up a bit, they can come together and then actually also form one of those normal backbones and come together in a complex like that. So that's kind of our you know, chemical ligation here. This will open up at 90 degrees so you can recycle your molecules, but at 70 degrees that will stay together and I can, uh, you, you know, also do it from the reverse complement on the other side. It's this typical strategy how to keep things on an exponential level that one side replicates the other and the other side replicates one side that basically you can get to a complex like that from two perspectives. And as you heat it up to 90 degrees, everything will dissolve. You can reactivate by cooling the reaction. But if you only go to 70 degrees, you only separate these parts here and then if you go down and switch between those two, you know, think about a convection flow, you could have these parts come here and, you know, again, get to that complex we just saw uh, before here together. And then you could think about replication machinery. So it is, it is a bit motivated by how far it can go for replication with binding uh, and temperature alone. So that's the analogy a bit to a laser where you excite it, you pump it to a high uh, state, you cool that fast down, you get the hairpin, your upper laser level, and then you know stimulated emission would be, you, know, you bring in the template and you cycle between those two temperatures and let it replicate. The idea being that in a convection flow like that, for example, you just heat it up here to high temperatures, then you separate those molecules and those are activated as they diffuse to the inner levels of that convection flow that would cycle then between the temperatures to go for replication. And that would, you know, in a way feed, activate the molecules and would be able to continuously run a replication cycle. So there are tons of details on that. Um, 
I probably skip a little bit on those. Um, gel to look at it, you optimize the lower temperature, you optimize, have a look where the concentration depends is actually somewhere you'd like to have it. You optimize the top temperature that uh, things are working as efficient as possible. And then you actually see curves like that, which tell you that you have the replication scenario that you have cross catalysis here from one side, but it starts to get exponential because you have replicated also the other side to the point that it back reacts and raises exponentially or to test exponentiality again by a serial dilution um, where we, as we saw it in the ligation chain reaction, let it react feed it again with new molecules, let it react, feed again, let it react, feed it again. If you have both sides and can uh, run exponentially, it will survive. If you have only one side, it will um, bog down. So you can push here and, and think about replication fidelity. That's a bit of a longer discussion. It has to deal with that you are giving it only not all the food, but missing one molecule. So you force it to do a mutation and by that drop down to 40% that it does so, you can get an idea how is the fidelity of building in the right molecules if you enforce it to make mistakes. And that's actually not too bad, uh, but it's also not too overwhelming. It's you know um, in the ballpark what, what I think you can expect for a prebiotic system. Dieter. Like that, yes. Just to, uh, there was a, uh, a remark on the YouTube channel yes. that you, if you could up the volume of your microphone a little bit. I see. I'm sorry. Yes, I'll try. It's <coughs> better now. You might get echoes some, sometimes if I move it up too much. Thanks very much. Um, yes. So what we liked on that system is that these initial molecules we thought about are, you know, on the one hand side optimized to make, make this reaction, on the other hand side actually are of motivated and the sequence comes from a well-known molecule, which is a, a tRNA molecule. So we'll get that actually in a second. I'm sorry, I forgot that. Uh, I need to move my thing here a bit, eh, that it's not in the way. Okay. Um, what we found on such a system where we allow the system actually to make long strands is that they actually sediment over time. So just give it a little bit time of a day or so and the molecules are making these clusters, not only you know something like that, but even much larger clusters, very much similar to what you saw for the, for the ribozymes. And they actually are heavy enough that they sediment down. We found that quite fascinating that you can you know, push DNA, RNA systems, that it actually starts to sediment. And what was interesting in that system, if you, out of these eight parts, remove one down here, you don't get any sedimentation. So you can actually think about that if these molecules are sedimenting, they're actually in a way complete. And the sedimentation could be a selection pressure for the molecules to be able then to, to run these replication reactions. We try to make them shorter. Right now there's 75 mers, which is motivated by the tRNA analogy. And we try to make systems which go smaller. We get now down to 22 bases and two molecules. So that is something where the sequence space is not as enormous and we might actually be able to select those by such gravitational forces. That's just a test here. You know, these are the full systems with you know, different Binary coding, as you see, it was zero, one. We can code that. Those are sedimenting heavily. The others are not as sedimenting. You know, some outliers here for these guys. So the idea here is it's a selection by sedimentation in the convection. You can think that you, you, know, you let the system run and it sediments and selects in the flow only those guys which are actually able to make these many longer structures. The motivation comes a bit from that tRNA, which is the ribosome central molecule, which gets here in the anticodon binding to the meshed RNA, to the three bases, you know, from the genetic code. That's the definition of the genetic code down here to the amino acid. It is a bit motivated that as we refold that by 
smaller mutations on the molecule. The amino acid is close to the anticodon. You could think that there's some encoding of the genetic code, but that's a big, big question whether that works this way or differently. It might be different geometry. And then you, you know, your replication here in the center of the color coding would correspond to a linear way of arranging your amino acid and potentially, you know, could go a little something towards that these replicators could encode peptides, amino acids. But, you know, it's, it's just a, you know, first idea and implementation. It's an interesting thing how you could get for the first proteins. Okay, I'll just uh, try to check the time a bit. Um, I'll try to go through that and then um, finish after that. Um, this is a recent uh, uh, paper just came out two months ago where we thought about the following. What is happening if we just have a 12 more random sequence and we make a ligation? We're not using the EDC we talked before. Uh, we use here again a protein, but it is the hope that uh, we will find uh, some ligation activity with RNA in the future. Um, there are ribozymes, you can also do the ligation. So let's just assume we have that ligation. It's a very precise uh, protein doing that. And the question is, we start here from random sequences. We do this, we get longer strands. Will they still be random? And this is our first time we managed to get the Illumina sequencing in the, in the deal. It took us a while to optimize it and to get it run. And the quick answer on that, this is not random. So, and it's not random also by the fact because we run here temperature oscillations again. And uh, it's quite peculiar what kind of network structures come out of that. Um, here, if we only look at the length, of these strands as we run the experiment. The experiment runs for several days, thousand temperature cycles. We get longer and longer strands. Get here the concentration of the strands, quite a flat distribution. We get quite long strands. And uh, I mean, one of the questions you might wonder, uh, how does the system go about anyway, right? Because these are random strands. So you would expect that they should get to a configuration like that, right? They bind to each other. Ligation cannot bind. There's no ligation. Nothing should happen. Um, it turns out it is an interesting fact that this hybridization to that one is actually significantly faster. So if you heat it up, cool it down, but don't let it enough time to fully get into equilibrium, which would actually take quite a long time, you are much more fast to get a configuration like that because the concentration of finding these six bases here is um, much higher and therefore the rate of binding is much higher. So if you just note that rough on rate of hybridization, how fast do strands stick to each other and do a back on the envelope calculation of those 10 micromolar concentrations you have here, if this wants to happen, those 12 mers have two to the power of 12 if we go for two bases. That's the on rate, that's the concentration. So roughly the time scale is 400 seconds. What you do get in this setting where you have either binding on this side and you know independently binding on the other side, you would have a much higher concentration because the sequence space is half the length and actually you know, um, many orders of magnitude faster, it's those six seconds. So in our experimental scheme, we didn't give it enough time to hybridize. So we are actually looking more into these structures and then we see the ligation. So we found that quite interesting that that timing is actually something which is uh, driving the reaction. And if you would go for all four bases, it actually becomes prohibitively slow and uh, only by making very, very long, slow ligation reactions, which we just tried recently, we could also get them ligating. But normally, if you go for four bases, you just see nothing. And that's a gel on it. So you don't get any longer strands, no matter what you do. But it's kind of interesting that these systems are self-selecting for shorter, smaller sequence space, because only those are able to 
show the replicative also elongating dynamics. So you can even more have a look in that and uh, short time to hybridize. Um, you see nothing if you go for 10 seconds for that short time here. If you increase the time, you get longer and longer strands. So that's suggesting that this idea is not too wrong. And um, you go down for longer times because you get fewer cycles to ligate here and therefore also ligation slows down here. So it's kind of timing uh, you have in here and we'll have a lot more look, a closer look into that. That's kind of all the supplement actually what I tell here and it's, it's not yet fully, um, fully shown, demonstrated. I told you about sequencing. Uh, um, if we really look in the sequences, we start with as 12 MERS. So they have a distribution, which is Gaussian. So here are the sequences which only have T, here are the sequences will only have A. And of course, in average, it's a mixture of both and you get that Gaussian distribution. But the funny finding was already when we go for 24 MERS, this is not Gaussian anymore. It actually shows two types of sequences either predominantly A type, that you have a lot of A's on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, or you have T on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, but not a mixture of both. And the idea, and also a lot of modeling in that uh, paper here, uh, suggests that these are hairpins which can't participate anymore in this ligation reaction. They're stuck at that scheme here and therefore can't replicate. So they can't make a network by which they can help each other to make longer strands and therefore are falling out of the distribution. So these guys here lose out and we get these two types of sequences. And they actually uh, make quite a remarkable network if we look at the sequences we find which are complementary to each other. So it's not only that they avoid the hairpins, they also make networks of the ligation uh, which are reverse complement to each other. So there's quite an interesting structure coming up by that non-equilibrium setting of thermally oscillating and trying to make strands, longer strands, which are again, always template for the other strands and so on and so forth. Um, uh, we're only looking at the start of fully understanding what's going on here. Um, but one way is that we used uh, the sequences we found predominantly to create networks uh, and create modes of how you can create these longest trends here to fully understand the system. Okay, so, so that gives us a, a little bit to jump from random sequences to structured longer sequences. And the hope is that there might be some ribosome activity here or some other evolutionary dynamics. The point is that uh, you start from huge sequences of randomness and actually the replicative uh, dynamics, the speed to find partners is putting yourself to shorter and smaller uh, sequence spaces here. That's kind of a funny, uh, funny observation that you can you know, reduce from randomness into more structure. So we call that a bit symmetry breaking. The other papers we published before <coughs> <laughs> that's also demonstrated that it's, you know, you start from a biased pool or a random pool, you get networks, and the networks self-select themselves out of the random initial condition. And you could think that if your random initial condition is a little bit biased in one direction or the other, you know, you either get stuck to one replicative network or to another replicative network and start to, you know, shrink down and confine your evolutionary space how that could work out, but that's a longer discussion. Um, what we are a lot fascinated nowadays is that we have air bubbles. The air bubbles here have a big advantage that they accumulate. So we go beyond the thermophoretic traps. Um, it opens up to make the traps actually also wider. And we could demonstrate in such a system that you can get, and we can go into details later in the discussion if you want that you get quite a nice, interesting combination of effects at these bubbles, because you have a little bit of wet price cycle, you accumulate molecules based on the size, you can trigger gelation, you can see that ribozymes are actually quite happy at the interface. If we have lipids, 
those lipids are forming vesicle structures at the interface. You can crystallize molecules if they are up to crystallization. And the wet dry sect can also drive you the RNA phosphorylation. And hopefully we can push this also in the future for more, more prebiotic approaches that we can breed whatever polymerization or other things to get uh, RNA happening at the interface. So that's our working horse right now. And I'll just go a little bit forward in these. This is kind of the machinery, how this looks in the lab, how it runs. Automated microscope where we have a Teflon sheet, which we can cut out with a plotter, have four injections and put this between uh, glass slides uh, so that we can see from the top how things are happening, have full control about the geometry and can apply actually a temperature difference from front to the back. So that's what it is. Uh, we work together with uh, consortia in Munich. Uh, Origins cluster is a consortia with um, astrophysicists and uh, particle physicists, and they asked us to join and you know, to extend the astrophysics even to the point, you know, not only go for planets, but think about how to make that transition. We have a emergence of life initiative, funding initiative by the DFG uh, going where we try to get the cross disciplinary mix of people to converge and link ideas, a lot of geoscience in here. And then I'm part of the science collaboration origin of life, uh, you know, we collaborate with Jerry Joyce and uh, have really great discussions and supports the lab very generously. And uh, in addition to ERC advanced grant, we are living off at this point. So that's uh, the team of PhD students and some postdocs. And Christoph Mass is our um, hero in the background, trying to get things going and uh, organize everything. So. This is an overview. I'm happy to, you know, go in details of questions and, uh, you know, just please uh, don't be hesitant to ask. We have plenty of time to go through the details of it. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dieter, for that uh, lovely talk. Uh, very enjoyable indeed. Are there any questions? The ones here in Zoom, um, just turn off your, uh, your microphone. I turn on your microphone and just speak up where we're not with 100 people, so that's easy. And in Zoom, you can put things in the chat and I'm happy to send them on to, to Dieter. Uh, I can start. Absolutely, uh, go ahead. Um, so Dieter, I was intrigued by the, uh, the these, when you started this random short uh, sequences and then you basically escape from randomness um, that is driven by a sort of negative selection in that anything that, at least as far as I understood, anything that folds cannot replicate. And that raises an interesting issue. And I guess it has been bugging the RNA replicator field for quite a while that if, in order to make something that is a ribozyme, you need it to fold. Yet in order to replicate the thing, you need, you, you can't have it folded. Um, so, here you're selecting for things that are difficult or at least that just don't fold under these conditions. So you're selecting, are you then not selecting against anything that, that, that might turn into a ribozyme? And is that not taking you in the wrong direction? I'm not sure. Is this, that is a, it, is not, a, it is not as it is not as black and white as, as you know these data here suggests. Uh, um, you do also have, and we saw that in those networks here, we also get elongating replicators. So those guys here are actually, you know, replicating by making pieces where you have, you know, ending like that. And then you just add two of those, two of those, two of those. So there, you know, also helping structures could be added to those endings. Um, we also, you know, still get structures which are folding into hairpins. So I think it will depend a bit on your boundary conditions, on your temperatures, how high you would go for, for uh, temperatures, or if you would go for less salt concentrations, you would you know, form less and less of those hairpins. And I think also if you have more complex structures where 
Now, as you see in the ribozyme, uh, where you have you know, rather a complex thing, not too many, too tight happens, you know, you could think that those are actually opening up and, and allowing themselves to replicate. But um, while you can tune that, you do have part of that reduction of the sequence space by those hairpins. And there's a second part, and you can see these zigzag uh, functions here, and they didn't go in the details of those. So we started actually with a bias because our oligosynthesis has at the three prime end, typically a little bit of bias of sequence. And that bias um, gives you actually some starting in equilibrium and that is actually amplified. So you get that zigzag zebra structure at the location of, um, of the strand. So, so you also get effects where you amplify initial sequence biases by exponential replication. Um, you know, whether that now matches precisely what you want for ribozymes, let's see, um, yeah. let's have a look, right? So what is the, in, in this system, it's, it's a, a serial transfer type or a flow or is it, so what is, what's the- We, we were lazy, we, we could go for that, but we were lazy because we argued that our initial pool is not depleted enough. So we just have one epi, we just cycle it long time and we get away with having enough feeding molecules without going to- So nothing dies. Nothing dies in this, uh, but we don't need to feed it. So- um, Yeah, but that would, I would, and then I'll stop, but uh, <laughs> room to other people. <laughs> I would love to see how this would behave if you were to introduce some sort of degradation mechanism, particularly when it gets to be selective. And, and there, I think, your folded molecule would have an advantage of being uh, more robust against uh, a chemical degradation process. Here we deal with, you know, this system we ran with DNA because the tap ligase is uh -huh. more thermally stable and the molecule, you know, the molecules under these conditions could survive those temperature cycles. You could run it in RNA, but then you're completely right. You know, then you have another selection pressure that, you know, these will survive actually better because hydrolysis is less. And um, that would be coming from, a, from a, that would open up a completely different perspective. Yeah. You know, cool. here on DNA, we are not breaking things up. So we can't yeah. go for recycling, but that will be crucial for the future because then, you know, the structure forming we kind of see in these initial stages could then go on, go on, go on, and it could become quite complex. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Um, so, uh, the spaces between mica sheets seem like a good natural environment um, for this sort of air bubble, heat change, um, and then also a templating ceiling and floor to it. I don't know what your thoughts are about real, real um, origin of life environments. We, we work on... With Judith Boner, uh, you know, we had those three, five prime cyclic polymerization of G, and she, you know, it's, sorry, I shouldn't, it's on YouTube, so I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, and, and she really looked very closely how these things are drying up, and the drying up process depends on the surface of the rocks. And therefore, you know, there's an interesting feedback loop that the rock samples might actually enhance polymerization in these systems. So, you know, let's see. I mean, for this, for these, uh, these evaporation cycles, uh, we have not, we have run one reaction for three, five prime cyclic, and we see a little bit polarization. Uh, so that's uh, to be submitted soon. And um, let's see. Uh, you know, this is evaporating on, on on sapphire surfaces, and it will be interesting to see. You know, depending. But then on the type between. That boosted. So so between sheets of mica looks a lot more like your little chamber there where it has two sides. Well, but mica is not 250 or a millimeter sized, right? So you would, you know, those millimeter? sheets of mica, those sheets of mica would be rather, you know, sheets here where you could think of that there's a special reaction going on, right? 250. Microns, you know, these are. Oh. Oh, your size. chamber. Oh, so, well, the mica sheets can separate. So at the edges, the mica sheets separate. And so they can be any space, um, any distance I see. Okay, cool. 250 you know, microns. You know, the, the results yeah. of Merlinite clay 
people have you know criticized that results from ferris a bit that you need a special cleaning protocol before to remove the ions that they're getting catalytically active um we'll have to see you know i, I think at some point everything must come together to to make the best the yeah best yeah evolving yeah machine. but my, my, mica is totally different from clay and has yes. potassium between its sheets which yes. is um so yeah but thanks for pointing out the 250 microns yeah. and how okay yeah thank you Well, maybe I can ask a question. Um, I, I wanted to uh, ask about the um, network of uh, um, well, polymers that you get. So, um, it, well, my question is uh, a bit along the line of the, of Cibrenotto, uh, in the sense that I'm wondering whether uh, this uh, reduction of the uh, space of uh, uh, of the sequence space might be uh, in the long run, going to too much reduction. In one, on the one hand, I see that it's nice to reduce the space because it's starting from random, going to selecting something. On the other hand, um, for evolution, for long-term evolution, there should be some kind of uh, variation happening. So I couldn't quite get if this happens in, in your system. Um, perhaps we, we can switch to it. Sorry, let's hope that this works out. Uh, almost getting there. Yes. I mean, I mean yes and no, right? Uh, it's not really. I don't know what's here. To search for this one. Ah, here yeah, it's better. Um, you know, we talk about 12 mers, and we talk about that those 12 mers, you know, come together here. And, and then, you know, locally, you can amplify sequence biases you have here uh, exponentially. And, um, it all depends a bit on the length of these guys. You know, we are not defining the length of these guys fully. So if you want to go for a hundred bases, uh, you know, what the pro what that system still does is, you know, add many of the shorter strands on it and replicate from there. So, so we have not yet studied the system where you have, you know, a length distribution concentration which is you know as expected from a polymerization to be exponentially uh, going downwards that you have a mixture of these uh, sequence lengths and uh, if you have the mixture you'll have quite a high concentration of shorter strands and longer strands and if the longer strands you know select the sequence you still have quite a potentially or probably diverse shorter sequences so i mean we'll have to see i, I think I just find it interesting that the system gets, you know, on the one hand side, if you really want to go for longer lengths, those long lengths just take too much time to hybridize and get the position because it's, you know, four to the power of the length. And uh, by that, you slow down the time scale. You know, the, the time scale is just proportional to that, uh, to that uh, phase space. Uh, so there is some uh, thing in between, but even if you go for a defined length, it was 12 for our case, if you go for two bases, you get long strands. If you go for four bases, you get nothing. Um, and if you go for two strands, actually you get longer ones if you start with a peculiar network, which is very well binding to each other and, and uh, replicated for longer lengths. So, um, you know, if you have a system which selects out longer strands, by whatever diffusional mechanism, you know, you will have a convergence of that phase space towards that shorter one. That doesn't mean that you're, you're if you have mixtures, right, you still have quite a complex dynamics. And um, yeah, so, so it's too uh, early to say 100%. Oh, okay, okay. You know, Basically, that was my question. So do you know anything about, so how, like the dynamic, the balance between the collapsing of the, of the sequence space and the, maintenance of diversity but uh, and what kind of diversity if it's uh if it's a the, the kind of healthy diversity that drives evolution you know evolution in it's in its common sense is that you make the evolution on on some function right i mean that's what you think it has to have a ribozyme it has to have a catalytic function and then you go from there if that function is enhancing the 
the ligation capability, uh, that's something. But it's always a big question, how do you get to that, you know, say RNA function? And I'm just very interested in the cycles where you have quite a simple, you know, physical, uh, chemical um, selection before getting to that state. And, you know, and that's the speed of hybridization, that's uh, the concentration of sequence spaces. And I'm, I'm, I think we just need to figure that out before we can actually talk about that big jump to those 150, 180 bases of a, or RNA world, if, if that's our scenario, uh, or we find also, you know, other diversions, which actually also need that compactification and speed up of, of the sequence space dynamics. You know, I'm, I'm just worried that we go for a system where we dream on what would be great in here, you know, and, and skip all those things because they will be in place. You know, hybridization dynamics will be there, sequence space uh, dilution will be there, and, and you have to find a solution for those. Sure, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a very cool system. But I think there's a lot of freedom, you know, but I, I can, it, it's always hard to say, you know, this must be not working because of this and that, because um, you can tune it. And, you know, evolution would have picked the one which was successful down the road. So let's see and try to emulate that new experiment. Thanks. Um, hi. Um, really, really, really great talk. It's super interesting. Um, I'm, I'm Peter, and uh, I'm uh, I'm tuning in from Atlanta. From uh, I'm a graduate student at Georgia Tech, and uh, my lab studies the ribosome uh, from um, from the Lauren Williams's lab, and I really find this um, very interesting. This RNA molecules that you have because the the way you you draw them it's very reminiscent to a half of the PTC of the ribosome the kind of very hard the very deep parts of the ribosome that I mean according to our evolutionary studies based on its structure is the most ancient part that was likely present in these times of chemical evolution. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm sure you, you you have this idea and you, you've I kind of- well. I don't know enough about the ribosome to, oh, okay. know, please tell me. So which parts do you do you see most so, reminiscent of that? Uh, this is, we should have much more talk because this is sure, so to. reminiscent to, um, it's, it's really the, the, the heart of the ribosome where the actual peptide bond is being created. And where you put the amino acid is right where it should sit. Because, you know, the ribosome is very complicated, right? It's very large. But at its core, you have the peptidyltransferase center where the two tRNAs are located that bring the amino acids, right? And then you have a hole it's the most important thing. Well, I don't know. everything is important, but you have a hole. That's the tunnel that ensures the peptide chain goes out. And the tunnel over the evolution of the ribosome just accretes and grows with the evolution, like with, with the growth of the ribosome. But when you draw these two hairpins and the unstructured part, uh, not unstructured, but uh, not base paired part, it's like you're drawing half of the initial kind of hole on the on the side of the ribosome, and it's it's very interesting, and I think it's kind of very reminiscent of of what we kind of look at, and what we are experimenting in. I'm on the bioinformatics side, but the experimental people are working a lot with these uh, very simple systems, but uh, about twice the size of what we're looking at is here. That um, very exciting. So if you, if you have time, hang around. Oh, happy to discuss the details. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so I had some more specific chemical questions. At the very beginning, you said something about the stability of RNA and magnesium. That's kind of, that, and I know that it's, it's always a, a, 
a problem, but uh, at very early RS, you would have no, well, it's likely we didn't have that much magnesium because of the reductive state of the oceans and the environment. You, it's much, much likely that the atoms, the, the ions that were at the time are iron. So do you have any kind of uh, thoughts on that and any kind of data on kind of the usage of iron? Because iron has like, yeah, problems as well. Yes, I mean, you, you probably know all the papers, Shostak on iron and other things, you know. I, I mean, these these ribozymes are, are breed here for, you know, high magnesium, it's 200 millimolar, it's super high, and therefore you run into that problem. And I'm not sure how well that has been actually explored to think about how iron could help you there. But, uh, um, you know, probably a little bit more how much, you know, that degradation will change on iron. And yes, I mean, that's that's something to go for. I would also love to, uh, you know, these, these bubble traps have the interesting aspect that you accumulate magnesium only locally at, the, at that site where you also accumulate the RNA about five or tenfold, you know, likewise also iron. And um, then there the concentration is um, is high. You do the reaction there and we saw that uh, for the, I can probably, uh, let's see how far we can, how fast we can scroll. So if you put a ribozyme in those bubble traps, they're actually operating quite effectively at the interface. And you think it's a combination of the accumulation of the of the ribozyme there, you know, that's a helping ribozyme which cuts the substrate and it's cutting the substrate in here and very effectively. And, and the, the thing it's cut actually goes into the liquid here. So because the magnesium is accumulating here, we like that quite a bit because in here, you don't have so high concentration. So if you thermally cycle material, it is low concentration. It will not degrade so much, but you only have it where the reaction actually goes on. But also, I, I think the future of RNA world is probably also for, you know, ribozymes, which don't need as high iron concentration. Number mm -hmm. one, you know, operate also in other conditions and, and are a little bit more robust. So we hope a bit that ligation will help there if we don't go for base by base. But, you know, that space is not fully explored mm -hmm. despite all the hard work of the leading groups there. So let's see how that uh, will evolve. And I had, if I may, just the, on the templated ligation, just so um, all, the, all the slides were with AT on them. So like, the, yes. um, so uh, do you have any comparison with only GC type of thing? So like you have random AT sequences, but um, I, from, from my perspective of looking at structures of things like GC is very, it's, kind of more interesting maybe? Yes. I mean, they're both interesting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, we run the experiment also on a GAC, on um, a GC. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem is the efficiency of the Illumina um, sequencing is, is a lot less. So instead of, you know, say 100 million sequences, we only get thousands out of it. Uh, we have to actually go a little bit for higher temperatures. So we tune a bit the melting of it. And then we also see that uh, the, the same occurrence of those two peaks, but it's much more noisy because getting the data is a little more difficult. So in that sense, for what we see, we think uh, it, it does not depend whether you got AT or GC. It mm -hmm. looks similar, but the data extraction is much more difficult. It's hard to compare timing and stuff like that, I guess, because I would be interested in what 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 causes? Told us if you go for GC only sequences, Illumina will not do it. But then we learned through the sequencing center at the Gene Center in Munich that you know you anyway spike you know homogeneous sequences that Illumina is more happy with not having only two bases, um, and then you know you can overcome that. You get sequences out, uh, but uh, the overall efficiency is quite quite low. Um, but of course, yeah, I guess also you go for high temperatures first, you probably first have GC sequences. And, but for this test system, it was a little bit hard to, to explore experimentally. Mm -hmm. and we, we just believe in experiments because, you know, initially we didn't, it, it's always so nice in this field and in evolution, you know, what you think initially is typically wrong. So that's why we need to do the experiments. 
Thank you. Right. Maybe that's a, a good point to stop on this philosophical note, <laughs> Dieter. Um, so um, thanks very much for being here. That uh, don't don't go just yet, of course. Um, um, but uh, um, we'll close off this session. Uh, for those of you who want to go uh, to the next one, the next one will be on the 11th of May, and Paula Caselli from the Max Planck Institute will uh, will be joining us and talk about our astrochemical origins. Um, if you want to speak to Dieter for a little longer, then just stick around. Um, and I will make him co-host. And uh, for now, I uh, bid you all farewell. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. The light.